Oh, allow me to hazard a guess. You bring me bad news. Jagged Alliance is a series of strategy RPG hybrids that had okay sales and a cult following. The last major installment was developed all the way back in the 90s. The series is old and loved, and there is nothing quite like it. Over the years, there have been many attempts to bring it back, most of them embarrassing. Understandable, the game is complex. Jagged Alliance is a sophisticated machine with many moving parts. Tactical combat, a strategy map, a business management layer, RPG elements, quests, experience levels, characters, and it had so many quotable lines. <laughs> No need to wear a hat now! So in order to replicate or improve this classic game, one needs to be knowledgeable in multiple mediums. Screw up one thing and it doesn't feel authentic anymore. Screw up two things. Well, we've seen this before. We know where this leads. It leads to us fucking a snake monster in Portland. That's right! Give the evildoers a beating! But there is talk on the World Wide Web. A new Jagged Alliance game is out. Will it succeed where everyone else failed? Or are we doomed to walk the earth, never again experiencing the glory that is late Sirtak? Smell a miss, Woodman. Why bother? Things sure seem hopeless. But perhaps the new caretaker of the series has an ace up his sleeve. It's an old legend. In the heart of the Chernobyl exclusion zone, there is something called the Wish Granter. A being or a place, God knows what it is, but any wish given will come true. One day, a man from Bulgaria braves the zone, reaching the wish granter. I want... I wish that my favorite childhood game, Jagged Alliance, had a proper sequel, he says. And the wish came true. So is the curse finally lifted? Well, uh, you see, in the community, when we say Jagged Alliance, we actually mean Jagged Alliance 2, the one with the RPG-like structure. The series has four installments, and only one of them is a classic. Not even its expansion pack is played. The rest of them are good for what it is tier tactical games. Solid 7 out of 10s. This is just a big misunderstanding. They made a sequel for a wrong game. Jagged Alliance 3 is only a few weeks old, so this is a no-spoiler review. You. I'm here to settle a score. You don't mess with- Half a year ago or so, I made a long Jagged Alliance 2 video, which is one of my favorite games of all time. The production took about a month. I had to finish the game, read the entire wiki, read the Jagged Alliance book. Then the third game got released, and now people are asking for my opinion. Is it authentic? Should we buy it? So let's do it. Let's take this thing apart. We are going to a place called Grand Chien, a French-speaking African country. The job is to rescue the nation's president, kidnapped by a rogue paramilitary force known as the Legion. I accept the contract with a stipulation that once it has expired or terminated, all paperwork is given to me to be destroyed. There is to be no evidence of this engagement. The original Jagged Alliance games of the 90s poked fun at cliches and stereotypes that existed in the action movies of the time. That's an interesting statement. I am so confused by this game. From the point of view of a Jagged Alliance veteran, it's basically like this. The tactical combat part of the experience is just as good and maybe even a little better in some respects, but the RPG part is atrophied. The game's website has all sorts of sentimental stories about the individual developers falling in love with the classic game. It's 10 a.m. I wake up, I turn around, and Jagged Alliance 2 was right there, lying next to me. He looked at me, he smiled, and said, Time to take out the trap! But his eyes said, I love you. I'm sorry, Boris, but he says this to everyone. The trash man screwed us. This obviously wasn't a lasting relationship. The developers made a number of changes to the Jagged Alliance 2 formula, most of which appeared to be side grades. They don't improve anything, but they don't ruin anything either. One unfortunate exception to this is the story. The classic really did poke fun at stuff, but this wasn't the point of the game or anything. In fact, for a short minute, let's go back to 1999 and remind ourselves what the classic game was actually like to play. 
After landing in Arulco, we make contact with the rebels and meet Ira, the idealistic left-leaning American student who arrived in the country with a Peace Corps and decided to stay. So what if I'm bitter? I don't care. I'm about to get even. She guides us to a Catholic priest in the nearby town of Drassen. The Hungarian-born tyrant Queen of Arulco allows him to operate with impunity, doesn't want to mess with the Pope. The Pope has a knack for getting in the way of dictators. It's something of a hobby of his. Eventually, we explore the ruins of the nation's only university, destroyed by Deidrana soldiers, Intelligentsia being her natural enemy. There's a university here that's as empty as the bitch's head. And in the mid-game, we liberate the death camp at Tixa and listen to the stories of the survivors. My crime? I was told to attend one of the Queen's speeches. Greg Dynamo Duncan practically begs us to let him join up. He has nowhere else to go. Tixa is also where we meet Shank, whatever his real name is. Shank got here for growing weed. His own regime-sympathizing bourgeois parents ratted him out. They probably didn't understand they were sending the guy to a death camp. The old game certainly had plenty of jokes, but it wasn't parody or satire. The story about liberating prisons and death camps probably won't work if it was a parody. And I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you meddling kids. And yeah, this is the first big departure from the classic. Exploring Grand Xi'an feels like you're exploring the Xiogorath's realm of mania. Not for one second did I believe that these are real people with real problems. This is exacerbated by the fact that the game has a lot of dialogue now, and almost all of it is filler to click through. If you are a Jagged Alliance veteran coming into this expecting the same narrative experience, you might have some very strong feelings about the new game, and not in a good way. That being said, I don't want to create a false impression that Jagged Alliance 3 is bad or stupid. It's just the game is now about solving abstract tactical puzzles. I could do this blindfolded and tied up. And uh, solving puzzles is cool, but like, who asked for this? I've played the series since the late 90s, and I've never met a person who was like, uh, this game is good, but the story bits left me too emotional, and I wish there was less of that. One of the big conversations we have in the RPG medium these days is the one about fusion of strategy gaming and role playing. The most authentic Fallout 2 sequel is a Hearts of Iron mod. There is an excellent Elder Scrolls game built on top of the Dynasty Simulator Crusader Kings, Kaiserreich, TNO, play another game. So why would you excavate this ancient property that all those years ago pioneered this fusion of strategy and RPG only to downsize these features? It doesn't even have that much of a fan base to monetize. What are you doing? What's the plan here, chief? Jagged Alliance 3, let's talk about the structure. All the layers of gameplay are present here more or less unchanged. Even the fake internet is back. In the old game, they imitated the 90s web. In JA3, it's the 2000s era. The design reminds me of the real-life fan site of Jagged Alliance, freelancer.ag.ru. Here are them side by side so you can see the similarities. The in-game version looks maybe a little too clean, but that's just me nitpicking. Clearly, a lot of effort was put into this. The Steam achievement statistics make me suspect that some players, quite a few actually, had issues with the fake internet and they never figured out that you can create your own character in this game. Surprisingly, that's not that big of a loss. There are very few customization options for your avatar and the voice acting is… generic. R.I.P. the take out the trash guy. But the characters are a huge part of the game, and there are only six slots in a squad. So why waste a slot on someone boring? Why even make a custom merc? Well, one reason is that you don't need to pay them a salary. They are a slave. They can do the behind-the-lines logistics tasks. You know, the jobs you used to delegate to cheap trash mercs. The default character name is Alpha. For those of you who want something more interesting, here at Warlocracy Labs, I had our PhDs translate and assemble a list of call signs of real-life MIA Wagner mercs to provide a source of inspiration. Roundness. Motorboat, Hugo Boss, Compost, Lie, Dualism, Elon. 
the heart of a Jagged Alliance game are the characters we hire, and the cast was always very diverse. The Jagged Alliance book explains that this was a practical solution to a problem. The game has a lot of characters, and it helps if the player can tell them apart. Makes sense. This is a good technique. And Jagged Alliance 3 gets this right. Some of the characters are good enough to be reverse modded into JA2, which is the best possible compliment I can give. I'm just gonna say it. I really think that was completely hot. The ambient dialogue and the one-liners are some of the most memorable parts of this game. Kinky, but I don't like it. Admittedly, my first impressions were kinda bad. I hired the Russian mercenary Igor, whose personality is that he is Russian, and the Ukrainian sharpshooter Kalina, whose personality is that she believes that the Slavic fairy tales are real. Then you need to ask me. You cannot just invade my space and take my things. I was curious if the two had unique interactions with one another. They did, but they weren't really that interesting or fun. In fact, the duo kind of ruined the experience for me, because both of them are written and voice acted like they're ten-year-old children. Made the game feel even more like a nonsense, whimsical experience. They are okay separately, but bringing them together in one squad is too much. Is this politics? Jesus, now that blows my mind. I guess that makes two of us. Let's talk about the graphics. The character models look nice, but there is no visual customization of any kind. I suppose there never was any. The mercs look distinct from the bad guys as well as from one another. I have no problems with this. The game now has a free camera. Interesting choice. The camera discourse is an ancient culture war that's about as old as the 3D engines themselves. You might have noticed that big strategy games like StarCraft II and the XCOMs allow little camera control. That's because a fixed camera makes the battlefield easier to read at a glance. I had no idea just how bad of a problem this was until I got to putting the video together. It's phenomenal how much of a visual mess this game is. Look at this. JA2, clean and readable. JA3, what am I even looking at? JA2 again, easy to read, easy to process. JA3, without the UI markers, this would be unplayable. I have no idea if this is a free camera issue or an art direction issue or both. Of course, one excellent reason to include a rotating camera is if the game's mechanics simply don't work without one, like it's the case with the Silent Storm series of tactical games with RPG elements. These feature extremely destructible environment. You can target and shoot individual floorboards. Silent Storm Sentinels remains the most successful attempt of capturing the magic of Jagged Alliance 2. I believe it had at least one X Sertag dev working on it. So, does the new game feature destructible environment? I think so, but I had to go online and look it up. This is simply not something that was relevant during my playthrough at all. But on the positive side of things, when it comes to visuals, the locations are more diverse than ever. We have all kinds of environments. Small towns, big cities, tiny villages. And yeah, the music. I am reminded of another African song, which happens to be one of the greatest video game theme songs of all time, and that is Baba Yetu from Civilization IV, a musical prayer to Jesus Christ in Swahili language. This song doesn't quite command the same power, but is nevertheless very good and memorable. The animal enemies are back. Hyenas are fast and deal a good amount of damage, but are easy to kill. Well, the TLDR on crocodiles is that they are this game's death claws. The 
Lord smiles upon you, brother. There is a simultaneous turns feature, like in Wasteland 3. This is very good. And a weather system. A new addition. Fighting in the fog reduces the effective range of weapons. Dust storms seem to have the same effect. Grenade throwing is visualized in a way similar to XCOM, but mechanically it's different. Grenades can miss and they do so all the time. The stealth system seems to be more sophisticated now, and the successful sneak kills don't trigger combat anymore. Another huge change is melee, which is now good. Jagged Alliance 2 had a total of three melee-related traits, and they were almost completely useless. Basically, exotic nonsense skills. Bringing a knife to a gunfight is a stupid idea was a stupid idea. Not in this game. There are characters who specialize in melee combat, like Steroid Gontarski and Igor Dolvich. There are melee-related perks that allow the specialist character to tank damage, like in Dragon Age. I think we should look around, yeah? The way we interact with the objects in the environment has changed. This is a big one. In the classic, these sort of interactions would trigger a decision-making loop. We observe a problem, a fence blocking our way. We figure out our options. Should we use wire cutters? Or one of them weird engineering knives if we have one? Or make an entrance with an explosive? We make a choice and execute the plan. This decision-making chain is gone. Bingo! When you see an interactable object, like this fence we can remove with wire cutters, the game automatically selects a merc with an appropriate skill to perform the action, all done with a single click. The Americans will come. They always come to a war. Jagged Alliance 2 took place in a fictional South American country, but it was actually just the United States. The sequel supposedly takes place in Africa, but upon closer examination, turns out that the game's setting is some sort of an exotic Yakubian reality. The African adversaries are designed like the aliens in the remade XCOMs. They differ in body shape, AI, and weapon selection and different aliens require different solutions. Grenaders are armed with grenades. Don't let them get too close. They also have a peg leg. Melee dudes project a zone of control inside which they get attacks of opportunity. Shoot them below the belt to slow them down. The imposing shotgun-armed legionnaires are the mutons of this game. Actually, they're much worse. They have a retaliation area of effect attack that applies a damage over time effect that needs to be removed with bandages. I'm not even sure how to deal with them. Shoot them in the arms, maybe. Let's talk about the aiming system. When they showcased this in the trailer, everyone liked it, but I was confused. What problem are they trying to solve that necessitated using this awkward-looking construct? Here's how it used to work. You see a bad guy. If you want to shoot him in the head, you click on his head. If you want to shoot him in the torso, you click on the torso. If you want to shoot them in the legs, well, you get it. Simple, elegant, Team Apple UI solution. Top notch. It is so very strange that a game from 1999 feels more modern than a game from 2023. But maybe I'm just being a penis. Perhaps internally the developers tested this solution and found problems with it. And you know what? This display gives new players a general overview of what kind of attack options they have. So it's not useless, it's just crude. Yes. They are all over me! Yeah, the enemies have a repositioning phase now. Another new addition is free move. Every turn you can move a few squares without spending action points. Keeps the battles dynamic. The battles themselves are much smaller in scale now. There aren't as many enemies and most maps are not very big. Everything ends very fast. <laughs> But one of the more striking changes is, well, at least in the early game, the battles seem to revolve around tactically applying debuffs. I had characters whose job was to shoot arms and legs, because their weapons weren't powerful anyway, and you don't need to actually deal damage to apply a debuff, you just need to hit. Hey, nice technique! 
Maybe you can give me some pointers later on. Let's talk about the mercs. There are a lot of them, although not quite as many as in the classic game. I suppose if Jagged Alliance 3 sells well, they can release merc pack DLCs or whatever. I'd be on board. Not sure how moddable this game is, but the art style looks like it might be too complex to be easily replicated. It seems there aren't quite as many viable opening strategies. Back in JA2, instead of spending money on a squad, you could get one super elite merc. Hello, you have the attention of Scope Sterling. That's no longer a thing. High-tier mercenaries are now behind a paywall and are unavailable at the start. And you can no longer do the Lilura strat, which is buying the most expensive mercenary Gus Tharballs for one day simply to get his badass weapon. I miss you, Woody. The game also confusingly sorts the mercenaries by their level, not price. This is not helpful. So there are flaws, but overall the Merc roster is one of the best things about Jagged Alliance 3. Let's go over the new additions. Anita Mouse Backman. Usually I'm the one to disappear. So what were we talking about? Technically, Mouse was added in Deadly Games, but she wasn't in 2, so I count her as a newcomer. Mouse can ignore Overwatch. That's her special ability. Oh yeah, the characters have unique special abilities now. Yuri Omrin, a Siberian native of Chukchi descent, a marksman who speaks Russian, French and English, starts with a short-range double-barreled shotgun. Lily Livewire Idrisi, a mechanic from Pakistan, with extraordinarily high wisdom stat and unique equipment. Very uh, expressive character, something of a social climber. I don't even blame myself, I blame overpopulation. Kalina Sokolova, the daughter of Ukrainian coal miners. Kalina learned from her grandmother how to hunt game in the wild and repair the machines and motors that held heat and power in the tiny town where they lived. The old woman filled her head with tales of adventure from Slavic folklore to distract her from her family's poverty. Of course the battle is going good. Kalina, the sword of Triglav, has a powerful ranged attack that ignores our Kevi Forda Agit, a fighter for the Peshmerga, was an explosive expert and one of the most expensive mercenaries in the game. Sorry if I mispronounced something. Quite a few old characters were reimagined and uh, almost universally for the better, I'd say. I like the new Gus. I love the new magic. Shadow and Reaper looked like the same person with a different haircut. In the original game, starting with a small number of competent mercs was a good strat. Expensive characters Characters are deadly and a small squad is easy to manage. But in this game, I found that a full six slot group of dysfunctional idiots works much better. Or I'll just follow you. After restarting the campaign half a dozen times, trying out different party compositions, I have to say I am not a fan of the tutorial island. There is very little variety to the game's fairly long opening, and basically you just replay the same six battles. This won't hurt a bit. Well, it won't hurt me anyway. You fight just like my sister, only less Hungarian. But not all mercs will be hired on the fake internet. Some of them will meet in the game world. Man, you're like a... This is Larry, a returning character. In the classic, he was a recovering drug abuser, and his gimmick was that he could relapse, in which case his personality becomes completely different. Mechanically, a very interesting character. Let's go, man! In this game, he joins our party if we pass a skill and an item check. He'll be doing the strategic map stuff. The strategy mode is largely the same. This is where we move our squads, tend to the wounded, repair items and train militia. We liberate towns and mines. The bad guy strongholds generate squads that would attempt to take them back. Like this boss! The militia AI is much better than in the classic, that's for sure. The world map is huge, but the individual sectors, especially wilderness areas, are compact. Most sectors can be entered. Some have an underground level or some sort of a side adventure. Others, just a few collectibles. We have agreement. 
Here is another big change. The online weapons shop is gone. If you need ammunition, you'll have to buy it from a street merchant or pick it up from a dead body. And I think there is a crafting system. Here's how it used to work. Not all bad guy equipment is dropped when they're killed. So in the classic game, you had to buy some of it on the web. This is very clever. The item descriptions in the store are different from those in the tactical mode. They're trying to sell you stuff. It's a sales pitch. Sometimes the individual in charge of the customer would steal items from you. That's a problem that needs to be solved. Pablo, where is the ammunition? Relax! You'll usually have a repair guy who is also a logistics guy who would physically carry the equipment to the frontline squad. And more often than not, this involved a trip in a helicopter. Skyrider here. What's your plans for the bird? This entire layer of activity is gone. But on the positive side of things, ammunition scarcity is a thing now, and it influences the types of equipment you'll use, since, at least in the mid-game, you probably won't have enough ammo to give everyone an assault rifle, which is the most versatile type of a gun. In fact, let's go over the weapons. Different classes of firearms are very distinct from one another. This feels less like JA2 and more like Wasteland 3, which is fine, I suppose. No need to wear hat now. Submachine guns grant an ability to move and shoot. Shotguns have a powerful area of effect attack. You are nothing but filthy butchers. The cone can be tweaked. Machine guns need to be set up to fire without a penalty. Once deployed, the machine gunner will fire at anyone who moves or does anything inside the cone. This is very powerful. It's also how Overwatch works now. In the classic game, the interrupt chance was governed by the character's experience level. The new system is much better, involves more decision-making, less random chance, and it's also the reason why sorting characters by experience level is almost meaningless now. Some mercs have cool traits that interact with the system by changing the shape of the cone. Then we shall unite the proletariat by destroying those Legion dogs. These guys are the communists, a friendly guerrilla faction, sort of like what the rebels were in the first game. I've heard it all before, Chimichanga. There's no bright future under communism. It is pronounced Shimu Renga. Ah, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it or what you call it. Socialism, collectivism, welfare. Grizzly is the avatar of Americness. This is one of the few bits of dialogue that might get a chuckle out of someone. Most of the dialogue in Jagged Alliance 3 is filler. I was in the army once, full of dope puffin' socialists. It's like Tolstoy wrote. War. What is it good for? So I hope you all learned something from this. You can fix anything with a gun. The bigger the gun, the faster things get resolved. You'd think they would teach that in school. Is JA3 a worthy Jagged Alliance game? I think so, yes. Is it as good as the classic? Is it authentic to its style and conventions? Well, no. But some things it does better than the classic. Will this be the Fallout 3 of Jagged Alliances, the game that brings the property to the masses? Probably not. But I do hope this makes enough money for the company to release Merc Pack DLCs or whatever, so we can cannibalize them for spare parts and reverse import the good content back into JA2. I want to emphasize that this game is not bad, and it's certainly not a failure. I've been playing this every night for about an hour before bed. It's not because it's boring boring or helps you go to sleep or whatever, it's just Jagged Alliance 3 is very low stress. The battles are quick, the dialogues you can skip, the map management is a few mouse clicks. If it sounds like something you need in your life, consider purchasing the game. But I've played this for 20 plus hours and I can't name a single NPC. I don't remember a single location name. I even forgot what the nation was called. Had to look it up. Grand Xian. I remove her like toilet paper from Rur. And I know the map of Arulco like the back of my hand. I can quote so many lines. Time to take out the trash. Elliot, you idiot comes with the territory. Time to stroll through the valley of death. She is evil. A driven bitch. How much underwear will I need?
I'm gonna be needing a lot of underwear pretty soon, so give me all your money via the crowdfunding platform Patreon. Patrons are not charged unless I actually make something, and never more than once a month. Hopefully, the next video, which is half done already, will be the funniest and the weirdest one yet. We'll be covering the Temple OS of Fallout modding. Patron credits, and then I'll talk about something I wanted to mention in the old JA video, but it ended up being too long, so I had to cut parts for pacing. These videos are made possible thanks to the efforts of the Patriots, including Danny Kilpatrick, Ray Nurse, I Feed My Parrot Chicken, Azazel and Baneful the Doggo, Buck Swope, Snafu, 1967 Ford Mustang, Dzmitri, Yuri Solodovnichenko, Miracle Moses Porter, Hank of the Hill, Eric Luitke Hans, Nathan Kabiska, Dark Butt Pumpkin, Sidirom Fossil, Mace Uva, Tony Spagani, Ganzo Bone Motherfucker, Ilya Rubin, Source is the Best Engine Ever Made, Jackson Phillips, Frog, Marching Iron, and C6. You probably heard of me, Calvin Barkmore. Broke every record they keep track of. So, the Jagged Alliance characters are not actually over the top. They are, in fact, pretty realistic. Few are aware of this, but people who gravitate towards war zones are strange, larger than life kind of individuals. Here are some examples of IRL Jagged Alliance characters Igor Strelkov, aka Girkin, aka Runov, the militant responsible for starting the Russo Ukrainian War back in 2014, as well as shooting down Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, convicted in absentia, loves live-action role-playing, appreciates Blizzard's classic game Diablo 1. A very obvious case of Asperger's, this is almost impossible to communicate to those who don't know the language, but Girkin has this distinct Russian boomer writing style, characterized by the overuse of quotation marks. This is very easy to convert to Jagged Alliance dialogue. Another IRL Jagged Alliance NPC was the Russian right-winger Yegor Prosvirnin, described as a real-life comedy relief character who combined a cult leader-like presence with neurodivergence and morbid obesity, a strange combination of privilege and disprivilege. In Jagged Alliance, he would be one of them MERC fuck-ups you hire in the mid-game to do logistics and militia training. And here is a classic example we covered before in a different context. Operation Red Dog was the code name of the plan of white supremacist mercenaries to overthrow the government of the Caribbean island nation of Dominica back in 1981. The plan failed, possibly because everyone involved was an IRL Jagged Alliance character. One of the mercenaries was Don Black, a KKK-affiliated politician from Alabama, who subsequently learned how to code while being locked up. Mike Perdue, the leader of the group, was an ex-Marine who, if I recall correctly, didn't even complete basic training before getting dishonorably discharged. He had no warfighting experience, but managed to build a mercenary veteran persona by reading Soldier of Fortune magazines. This was enough to trick his comrades, many of whom were Vietnam vets. This is some video game skill check shit. With just a bit of luck, he could have conquered the country. But not all IRL Jagged Alliance characters are morally abhorrent. Here is Spaghetti Kozak. I think his real name is Jim, the American journalist and YouTuber. Before joining the Ukrainian military, he used to review RPGs and retro shooters. He has a great video on Ultima Pagan, which was my first ever RPG. Dmitro Korczynski, a Ukrainian writer, fought in Transnistria on the same side as the Russians, in Chechnya on the side of the Chechens, in Kyiv against the cops gave a lecture on riot suppression at a convention run by the Putinist organization Nashi, founded the St. Mary's Battalion to fight the Russians in the Russo-Ukrainian war. Oh wow, Karch, what are you doing in Morrowind? People who get into this lifestyle tend to have a strange combination of qualities. If anything, the supposedly over-the-top JA characters seem tame in comparison. There is to be no evidence of this engagement. 